Um, just a quick announcement. Uh, we do have a new feature on Zoom. Some people had some issues hearing or understanding the, uh, the words uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, which luckily Zoom had been working on. Um, there's a, a feature now that's called live transcript. So I don't know where it is on um, phones or on mobile devices, but on laptops, there's a uh, feature that is uh, down at the bottom, it's called Live Transcript. There's a CC box on it. It is AA generate, AI generated, so it's not the greatest, um, but it is a transcript. Um, if you guys remember what it was like with Google Meet, similar. I don't know if it's exactly the same uh, technology, but um, it is helpful. It's not good with words that are not English or probably a lot of accents. Um, so I'm keeping it on for the recordings. Um, so that's just one thing that might help others out. Um, so give it a try, see if you like it. If you're having difficulty with some of the, the audio or um, you know, that's just a feature that you need. Thanks. And I think it's right about 11 o'clock. So Dirk, whenever you want to start, go ahead. Okay, let's start with, uh, oops, that I needed my mower here. Start with trying to get my scroll to work. <laughs> there we go. Oh, again, you John Sam a magis on Dongpola Yantsen Shogi no Dunye Be Majune Jesudrak Kodu Kandro Mambu Ko Yed Ki Jesu Dodru Ki Jin Jilu Teacher, photo destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, photo destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, 
to Yoy pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened the Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth, and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who were wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector to you I prostrate. Endowed with green marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you who is free from dust. Matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, field of ocean-like merits and good qualities, to the thus gone, I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning, to the Dharma that brings peace, I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, well abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also, I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, Homage to the Dharma Refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three, ever devout homage. To all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as atoms, realms, atoms, and all aspects, with supreme faith, I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action, accumulate virtue and goodness, subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning, and clouds. Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all seeing and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, stirred by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, by the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, 
remain as our guide and turn the wheel of dharma until samsara ends. Do the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen, and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala together with other pure offerings and wealth and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O oh, my masters, my yidams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth waves of your blessings. Yidam guru ratna mandalakam ni yatayami. Now the heart of the perfection of wisdom sutra, Arya Bhagavati Prashna Paramita Hridaya Sutra, I prostrate to the Arya triple gem. Thus did I hear at one time. The Bhagavan was dwelling of on massive vultures mountain on Raja Griha, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Aryavelu Kiteshvara, looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Aryavelu Kiteshvara, how should any seminal lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Aryavalokiteshvara, said this to the venerable Shadadvati Putra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly, beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no I element and so on and up to and including no mind element and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance and so on and up to and including no aging and death and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. 
Tayata, Gate, Gate, Paragate, Parasangate, Budhi, Soha, Tayata, Gate, Gate, Paragate. Tayata gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhi soha. Shariputra, the bodhisattva Mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, Arya Valakateshvara, saying, well said, well said, son of the lineage. It is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Shadadvati Putra, the Mahasattva, Aryavalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Ashuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. All right, well, good morning. Can you guys hear me well enough? Okay, perfect. So uh, my name's Connor McCann. Uh, my future name is Yeshi Kalpo. Um, student of Lama Jimpa's uh, last three years or so. Um, and I'm here to talk about love and sort of how we misuse love uh, within uh, bodhicitta and what we can do about it by using the sevenfold cause and effect method or system or meditation it has a couple of different uh, translations and ways to sort of say that. Um, so sort of our convention recently has been to tell what we're using for our talks. So mostly what I've been relying on is this book. It's called Bodhicitta, Cultivating the Compassionate Mind of Enlightenment. Um, it's by Venerable Losan Gyatsu by the Institute of Dialectics. So not Lama's teacher, the other Losan Gyatsu. A um, little bit of Cultivating Compassion by Jeffrey Hopkins. Um, uh, I always go to Alexander Version, study Buddhism online. Um, he's a great crib. Uh, for pretty, pretty much everything. And he's got a couple really good one-liners that we'll talk about. And then just because I'm studying it and doing the course with um, Kongshan Rinpoche, um, Liberation in the Palm of Your Hand by Pavanka Rinpoche, um, which, uh, you know, this is a, this meditation, the sevenfold um, cause and effect meditation is one of the main uh, variations of mind training that's done in the whole system to reach enlightenment. So uh, that the book has a lot on it. Um, so sort of to start out, you really have to know what bodhicitta is and what it's not. Um, so that's really where we're going to start. Um, so uh, Bodhicitta, what it is, is it's um, the desire that for the sake of others, um, desire to help all sentient beings to get out of suffering, out of dukkha, um, and it's combined with, it's two parts, uh, the longing or the desire to attain complete enlightenment. So it's wisdom and compassion combined. Um, 
And there's two main, two, two types of bodhicitta, right? So there's relative and ultimate. So relative is sort of the, um, the compassion, the wish to attain enlightenment for the benefit of all beings and to train in the methods to do that, you know, to, to do the seven step cause and effect meditation, to be able to help all sentient beings out of suffering, to achieve enlightenment. So it's sort of working within the relative world, the, the world as we know it here. And then there's absolute bodhicitta, which is direct insight into the absolute nature of things. And you need both. You have to have both relative and absolute bodhicitta to achieve enlightenment. So you can get one and that's great, but that's on the path, but you need both to achieve enlightenment. Um, what bodhicitta isn't? Um, bodhicitta isn't just always being nice to people. It's not just caring for humans. Humans aren't the only sentient beings around. There's lots of other sentient beings, a small percentage of them. Um, it's not just always being a good person. Right? If you're just a good person and you're just doing all these nice things, but you're not engaging in trainings, that's not bodhicitta. Right? So if you're just come into temple and you're being nice, but you're not really doing the prayers or you're not doing the trainings. That's great. You're a nice person, wonderful. That's not bodhicitta though. Um, it's also not unconditional love. So if you're doing the trainings and you're being nice to people and you're being unconditionally loving, but that's, the trainings maybe aren't, you know, you're just sort of going through the, the motions of them and you think I can just love everyone and I can just, you know, have all this love. That's not bodhicitta. That's something different. That's definitely not the path to enlightenment. That's not the path to liberate all sentient beings, not the path to liberate yourself. And that's a, that's a confusion that happens. Um, and that's sort of part of this overlay that um, a lot of my talk sort of focuses on is that we just wanna love everyone out of suffering. If we wanna love ourselves out of suffering, we're not gonna make it because loving ourselves out of suffering does not work on the attachment, on the anger, on the greed, on the hatred on all of those other things that is actually the suffering. We can't just say, oh, look, there's a spot on the floor and put a, an unconditional love covering over it and think the spot's gonna go away. That's not what bodhicitta does. Bodhicitta actually takes the scrub brush and the elbow grease and it rubs and it scrubs and it gets all those spots off and it finds out, okay, well, this, this cleaner doesn't work for it. What is the spot? Oh, it's this kind of spot. Oh, I gotta go get this stuff and I gotta work on it in this way to get those spots off. So it doesn't just overlay something on it. So that's really where we're going with this whole talk. Um, and that's where we get more into the relative bodhicitta when we start looking at the whole meditation, the whole sevenfold meditation, because relative starts getting into, relative bodhicitta gets into aspirational and action, right? So relative, you've got bodhicitta, two parts, relative and absolute. And then relative bodhicitta has aspirational and action. And there's sort of, Lama's talked about this a lot. Right, so the, the aspirational is, I really want to go somewhere. And the action is, I'm actually going somewhere. So both of those parts are sort of how you start to get on this path towards enlightenment. Um, and this comes from Shantideva Bodhichara Vatara. Um, I think it's the first chapter, um, I forget the whole site, um, but I think it's first chapter verses 15 and 16. Um, but aspirational is really, I want to obtain 
enlightenment for the benefit of others. Action is engaging in the wish to benefit others and pledging to do so by engaging in the six paramitas. So, you know, the generosity, the discipline, the patience, the diligence, um, you know, shamatha and wisdom. And so that's really what this meditation is about, is actually doing those things, actually engaging and doing things rather than just, oh, I'm going to love my way out of samsara, because um, that's not Buddhism. Um, so let's just take a, a quick look at compassion first. There's a couple different types of compassion also. Um, there's compassion focused on sentient beings, compassion that really focuses on uh, phenomena, and compassion that focuses without a reference point, um, sometimes without a, called without focus or with non-referential compassion. And this comes up later, but I just sort of want to introduce this concept that um, each of these ideas that we talk about, each sort of part of this meditation, you don't just go through it once. It's like everything else that we do. You know, you sit and you do shamatha and, you know, you do it for a month and you're like, oh, something's happened. And then you sit for another month and it's like, I don't know what's going on. I've, you know, nothing's happened anymore. But you got to keep working through it. Each layer gets sort of, uh, you know, scraped off a little bit more. And so everything that we talk about, there's another layer to it. And that's why it's not just, you know, you can't just go through this meditation once and think you've got it. It's training. It's like shamatha. You've got to keep working at it and keep doing it. And so, you know, when you think that you've made progress on one area, you really have to keep going because it's not a, a month long exercise or hour long exercise. It's a lifetime of training. Um, so let's talk a minute about love. And there's a lot of different ways to talk about love. And so if you Wikipedia love or you do internet church for love, you come up with a whole bunch of different concepts of love. And a lot of those in the Western sort of idea for love, um, most, most of them come up with like six to eight or 10 different breakdowns of love, usually using Greek words um, from anywhere from like, you know, sensual, passionate love to devotional love to happy love, you know, a whole broad spectrum of how to define love. And the love that we usually talk about, that we try to talk about within bodhicitta isn't really that same sort of love. And confusion happens a lot with that. I can't say that I have a very good way of expressing this and sort of what I've come up with and with the materials that I've used is that it's a simple love, a love that doesn't stir. Um, Geshe Gatsu actually uses the, a simple love of young kids holding hands. You know, so you, you see just little kids playing on the playground and they just sort of grab hands and they walk away with each other. That sort of simpleness. That's not, you know, they're gonna go kiss. They're not gonna go, uh, you know, be devoted to each other for life. That's not the sort of love that we really talk about specifically. However, within the sevenfold cause and effect meditation, there are different kinds of loves that, that you generate because that's part of the process is that you find affection for each other. You find different kinds of love that help you generate compassion, that help you generate the mind towards enlightenment. So 
it's necessary to start sort of thinking about love in different ways. Love isn't just one thing or another thing. There are different types of love that you need to really sort of generate and have awareness of. And I think that's actually part of the beauty of this is that it's not simple, but overall, it's not as, uh, it, you know, Burzen likes to call Westerners neurotic about uh, pretty much everything. And love is one of the things that we're neurotic about and also neurotic about our mothers. Um, and that's, you know, so just keep that in mind that, that love is much more simple in this meditation. And again, it's not something that we're overlaying on top of something. It's something that is generated as we start to work through other things. Um, so what is, or what is the purpose and how does it actually work, the sevenfold cause and effect system? And I'm just gonna read uh, a paragraph from Pavanka Rinpoche, because uh, I think he actually sort of summarizes it fairly well. Okay. Or let me tell you what the six. So basically there's, uh, there's a preliminary step and then there's seven other steps. And the last step, the seventh step is the result of the previous six, right? So the preliminary step is developing equanimity. Then there's recognizing other beings as having been your mother, recalling their kindness, resolving to repay their kindness, generating affectionate love, uh, generating compassion, developing superior attention, uh, intention. And then the resulting step is a mind directed towards supreme enlightenment. Um, Pavanka Rinpoche uses slightly different language and that's the, the language from Rosangatu but uh, I think you'll understand um, the same thing. The six, from understanding all beings to be your mother to altruism, he uses altruism uh, for developing the superior intention, are the causes. They result in the development of bodhicitta. This is how these all act as cause and effect. But before you can develop the wish to achieve Buddhahood to benefit all sentient beings, you must have the altruism to take responsibility for others' welfare. Further, you will not develop this altruism if you do not have such compassion that you are unable to bear the fact that all sentient beings are tormented by suffering. In order to generate this compassion, you must generate love through the force of attraction and attraction to all sentient beings, whereby they seem to be as attractive as your own dear cherished children. You must proceed such love by regarding all sentient beings as dear ones to whom you have the sort of attraction you have at the present for people you hold dear, but do not have for your enemies. Because the ultimate form of, of dear one is your mother, you will love and cherish as valuable all sentient beings if you can prove that they have indeed been your mothers, remember their kindness and wish to repay them. That is why this is known as the cause and effect instruction as each step is necessary preliminary to the next bringing such success, each succeeding one into being. All right, so let me see if there's any questions so far. Uh, hey, Dirk, can you go ahead and ask your question? Uh, I just had the question. My question is, are relative and absolute bodhicitta actually two separate things? Yes. I, 
am not in a position to have that philosophical discussion with you. So the simple answer that I'm going to give you is yes. The simple answer I would give would be no, but so sort of let it hang. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, at this point, let's go into the preliminary step of equanimity. Um, so, equanimity, uh, you may or may not know, there's three varieties of equanimity. Um, there's, uh, I'm going to go over a couple of these sort of quickly. There's equanimity of feeling, which is uh, basically neutral feeling of pleasure versus displeasure. Um, equanimity of compositional factors. You're basically, it's a meditative uh, state of uh, sort of balancing uh, lethargy versus excitement. And then there's that, the equanimity that we're actually interested in here, which is the immeasurable equanimity. And there's two types. There's a meditative equanimity, ensuing that all beings are freed from attachment and aversion. And the second type, which is a state in which all attitudes of attachment and anger towards sentient beings, irrespective of who they are, um, are overcome. And that's sort of this, uh, Kishikatsu considers that the supreme form of equanimity. And that's actually what we're concerned with for this uh, meditation is developing that type of equanimity where you're not concerned about um, what the being is, you know, is it, is it a friend or a foe? Is it you know, this, the rattlesnake on the trail or your best friend uh, sitting next to you right now. Um, and I have huge issues with rattlesnakes and snakes in general. So that's challenging for me. Um, so, you know, that, that's a, that type of equanimity is uh, one that's actually really what is interesting. So, uh, let me read from his book here. It would be advisable to reflect upon these facts continuously and not grasp at or send unquestionably to the appearances of friends and enemies in this life. Instead, we should cultivate a state in which we can fully discern the uncertainties of cyclic existence. This would be very helpful for our social interactions, guaranteeing that we remain honest, while at the same time opening the way for our spiritual practice. So one way to work with this, uh, according to Mosangatsu is that uh, we start working with the idea that we have cyclic existence and that we've had many lives. And so we start looking at the fact that the person who is our friend right now may have been our enemy the last lifetime or five lifetimes ago or a hundred lifetimes ago. The rattlesnake on the trail may have been our best friend last lifetime. So that's really how that meditation starts into equanimity, um, at least according to this writing. So this also plants the seed to start recognizing into the next seven steps because the, a lot of the basis of working with the rest of these, uh, the rest of the seven steps is recognizing cyclic existence. 
um, and recognizing that the being, the sentient being who is here with you now may have been your mother or your friend or your enemy not too long ago. So having equanimity and having that concept being familiar with you and working with you is very important, which is why that is a preliminary step and not actually one of the seven. I mean, I haven't actually seen any of the books or the texts that I've looked at um, call that like step eight or the first of eight. So I see a question in the chat if whoever wrote that wants to state that, that'd be great. Hey Connor, it's Ellen. Hey. I Ellen? just suggested to Dirk that maybe he could sign up for a Sunday talk on absolute and relative bodhicitta <laughs> and whether they're one or this one or different. I'll, so just a statement. I'll get him to do that. All right. So the next step, um, which is actually step one in the, the sevenfold meditation is uh, recognizing beings and having been your mother. And that's all the step is. We're not gonna go any further with this first step. It's just the recognition as, of beings as having been your mother. Um, and it's the next one, just, you know, the second one is the kindness of, uh, recalling the kindness of those beings, but just recognizing beings as having been your mother. And this is where we start to get into some of the challenges. Uh, and you hear this a lot, it's in a lot of the texts about um, recognizing, you know, different beings as your mother and how difficult that can be for Westerners because of our neuroses. <laughs> or our challenges. Um, and Berzin goes on and on about this, um, that we tend to have problems with every little thing that's done. Um, I don't know if you guys know, but my mom's on the call. Hi, mom. Uh, so the, the way that, Kishigatsu actually goes about this is saying, you don't just look at your lifetime right now. It's not just right now. It's not just your mother right now. It's all of your mothers, all of your sick, you know, every lifetime you've had a mother. You, you know, the spontaneous birth doesn't happen. At least I've not seen any evidence of it. I've not reasoned through that completely, but I'm pretty sure no. So you've had a mother every time that you've been here since the beginning of this time. So you managed to be born, have some sort of caring to get that way and to grow up in whatever fashion that is, if you're a human, if you're, you know, a mammal, you know, there was kindness there. There was a, a recognition that you've had a mother, that's it. And because, where's that quote from? One of my favorite quotes is uh, one of the first books that I read um, after taking refuge. I don't know if you guys remember my refuge ceremony. Uh, yeah. And so it was rather amusing because of my name, which is Keishi Galpo, and Galpo means king. And there was some joshing about that. And so I got assigned to read a letter from a friend. Uh, and there's this great quote about Nagarjuna that says, uh, you know, if you had a, a juniper berry or a little, basically a little pill ball made out of dirt 
for every mother that you've ever had since beginning this time, and you tried to make one of those for each mother, you'd run out of the earth from the entire world. You just wouldn't be able to do it because it's beginning this time. Some other great ones about your bones being higher than Mount Mero, which is another horror. Hey, so, Connor, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I was just wondering, you know, you, um, your previous quote that you you read out, it 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 struck me that in doing the meditation, what you're really trying to do is 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 generate that that um, sense of of safety and love that that somebody might have with a, a caregiver um, who could be their mother or could be anybody actually. So I, I know we have a lot of, we spend a lot of time talking about, you know, everybody's your, your mother and our lot, you know, you know, and our meditations. And maybe that's just the way that the, the teachings have already kind of been read, but maybe we can think about it differently and, and even think that, oh, maybe um, other teachers have been our, our lamas or, or other care people that, that we really you know, think about. So instead of spending so much time about this whole mother and, and people's neuroses in the West and stuff like that, maybe we should just think about generating that kind compassion that's similar to somebody who we really do care about. And, and that's, well, that's what we should be focused on. So the first one, the first quote was about equanimity, not about kindness or caring. And right now we're just seeing that everyone recognizing that everyone has been our mother. That's specifically what this part is about. And my comment, my comment was based on your, your quote, you know, previously, that maybe we don't need to be so wrapped up about whether or not we like our mothers. Maybe we should just think about, let's imagine, you know, say if we have a good relationship with Lama, like imagine everybody we come across was our previous Lamas. And, and think about them as, as the teachers that, that we, we care about, you know? So I just think that, I don't think, you know, after 12 years of reading all this, yeah, the mother thing's always kind of been interesting, um, but maybe the, the reading, the quote that you just read previously, it kind of just inspired me that maybe it doesn't have to be just a mother figure. Maybe it's somebody else who has shown us great compassion and, and and helped us along their, you know, our path. Yeah, that's, so that's true and that's part of it, but that's actually the next section. Right now, you're trying to actually create a bond with all other sentient beings by recognizing that they've been your mother. So if you wanna create that bond differently, that's fine, but you're not actually looking at compassion right now. You're creating a bond. Got it. The quote okay. that I read was specifically about bond. equanimity. So bond is right now. So what you're thinking is the teachings might say like a blood bond or something like that. Something that really ties people together, that there's a mother or you know, some relations in some way. Okay, thanks. Uh, Jack, do you have a question? Actually, I was just going to comment, you know, I think the focusing on the aspect of the mother is really, it highlights the interdependent nature um, of all of us with each other. And so, yeah, thinking of the mother specifically um, versus like a, a teacher, it just has that kind of element of we're all kind of creating each other. We're all uh, so deeply connected. Yeah, I like the way of thinking about it too. Thanks, Jack. I'd like to jump in on this too. I'm fortunate to have a, have had a very good relationship with my mother, uh, but some people don't, and some people have some people have been abused by their mothers, and people who have been abused by their mothers uh, find it hard to think of that as a, a meaningful type of relationship with a positive aspect. And most of the lamas that I've been taught by and who have, uh, that I've read have said that if you have that sort of an issue, that it's a very good idea to do what Dana's talking about and maybe use a different figure who has shown you great kindness and love in your lifetime so that you have those feelings that you can work with when you think of the bond itself that's being uh, 
worked on here. Anyway, that's my two cents. Right, and I totally understand that. And from my understanding, what I'm trying to do with this first one in particular, based on what I'm working with, is saying, great, but let's hold off the bonding and the kindness for something else. Let's, let's work on, and bonding, by bonding I mean kindness and relationship in a loving way. Okay, let's just work on we're all connected more in the interconnected part that Jack is talking about. And well, that interconnected part doesn't, what I'm saying is that that interconnected part doesn't have to be the mother. That's, that's, that's the point here. It's not the point of making the bond, but, but the interconnected part that you're talking about, you're using the mother and saying that it has to be the mother. I'm only saying it really doesn't, that's all. Okay. It, it actually could be everyone. I mean, you know, everyone and everything in the whole universe especially if anybody has a problem with the specific definition or how they were treated by their mother, or maybe how they were treated by their father and their mother didn't protect them, which is extremely common in this world. Yes, these things are all true. I'm, I'm in no way saying that this is a problem or that you can't do these things. What I'm trying to actually do is narrow this focus. Um, and these things do come up later on if you guys would let me get to it. So let's move on to the next one. Um, so if you recall the kindness, recalling the kindness of all beings, um, well, traditionally, the texts speak about mothers, does not have to be mothers. Um, Ishigatsu actually talks about uh, that it's not an attachment. Uh, he actually brings up it can't be an attachment because by logic, then you wouldn't get nations and citizens from uh, working together. Uh, I particularly like uh, versions example here. Uh, so all right. Um, since no one has the ideal mother, and some mothers eat their children. She might not have eaten us this lifetime, but perhaps in the last lifetime. Uh, the uh, recognition of kindness we have received is to develop a deep sense of gratitude and wish to repay the kindness. Um, but I find that adopting this meditation is very helpful for actually moving our hearts when we actually feel something. Um, and so many Western Buddhists do this meditation of love and compassion, um, actually go out and help others. So even if they have a difficult relationship with their parents, actually working to help others on, is helpful to work with that relationship. So rather than just actually thinking about relationships or focusing on parental relationships, what Virgin actually says is helping others generally is how you can actually start to work through repaying the kindness of what meditation says is um, other beings or motherly love, which is how he actually writes it out. Version says, repaying the kindness of motherly love. So um, the point of recalling or repaying the kindness of motherly love or the kindness of other beings is that 
you're actually starting to not only see other beings as some sort of connection to you, but you're actually starting to work with that connection and you're starting to say, hey, it's not just a head connection. It's not just something that, you know, oh yeah, I, I have, you know, this distant relative who's way out in wherever that I never see, but oh, this is something that I can actually do something about. I can work with this. So that's really the point of this second step is to actually do something, actually have something happen. Maybe it's just an actual act, like Bershin says, or as uh, Kishikatsu actually is a little bit more into actually thinking about and generating that desire to, you know, generating the, the kindness of what it is and what you want to do. So those are just sort of some differences there of theory if you wanted to go there. And you all sort of jumped the gun, so we'll jump the gun there. All right. Any questions, comments, concerns? No. All right. Uh, and I'm way over time right now. Uh, okay, could I just make a little comment there, even though you're over time? Sure. Yeah. Um, since becoming a mother myself and finding myself to be um, not perfect in any way, I found um, more understanding for my own mother. And perhaps it's the point actually that we not look at the mother figure as supposed to be a certain perfect figure that inspires us to love everyone. Perhaps the whole point of looking at this person as being your mother is that the mother is not perfect. The mother has kindness and failures. And then we can begin to look at bonds with everyone else as no one else is perfect either, but they have those those good things and bad things. So I, I actually find working with the mother figure now is not trying to seek this perfect image of the mother, but seeing it as a fallible image that we can all relate to. Well, and to that point, how are you supposed to find equanimity or how are you supposed to work with an enemy or a foe or something if you can't even work with your mother. So I, I appreciate that comment. Okay. Um, I'm not saying that any of this is easy or that it happens overnight or in you know a decade or two or this lifetime, but you know it can be quite challenging. Um, but you know maybe you need to start small. Maybe you start with your friend, maybe you start with your guru or your mama and that's fine. You start where you're at, where you're at. You don't need to start with the most challenging thing, but perhaps for some people it actually is more easy to start with the 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 foe. Maybe that is easier. Um, that that's actually something that Gisikatsu says. You know, maybe it's easier for someone to start with Trump, even if they hate Trump. Maybe that's easier. Maybe it's harder to say, oh, you know, my my friend did this to me and I just can't forgive him. Maybe that's much harder. So we sometimes hold our friends to higher standards, um, but that doesn't mean that we just lay down love on Trump and say, I, I can just love Trump. No, you still gotta work through everything. Um, so, I think at this point, uh, I, I, want to do. I think I'll give sort of the highlights for the rest of it. Um, you know, so once you've resolved to repay the kindness of your other of others, um, you know, you've got to sort of remember with that the differences between 
uh, what type of bodhicitta and, and compassion you're doing, um, affectionate love. But again, with affectionate love that you're generating, that comes out of repaying the kind, resolving to repay the kindness of others. Um, and it's not the love, it's not the love of the four immeasurables. Um, it's the love that you're really trying to get someone um, uh, that you're, you're training to develop uh, the delight or uh, you know, these affectionate feelings towards the beings uh, regardless of their feelings. Uh, well, that, that don't differentiate between their feelings uh, if they're, you know, Trump or your mother or your best friend, you know, that's really that affectionate love. And then that leads towards compassion, right? And so the compassion is really, um, you know, you're looking at suffering, right? The three different kinds of suffering. Uh, manifest suffering, the suffering of impermanence and you know, the suffering of suffering. Uh, and you just, you're wanting that suffering to stop for everyone. And that leads towards developing of a special intention um, to, uh, again, it's not the wish for sentient beings to stop suffering, but it's the training and the affectionate love and great compassion which leads to this um, because you want uh, you you basically leading towards the last step, which is the effect of developing the mind of enlightenment, so that you can bring others out of suffering. So that is the some second version of. Uh, the rest of that, and I'm sorry I had to go fast there. <laughs> um, but the effect is that basically through all of this training and meditation, um, you're working towards enlightenment. And um, you're basically trying not to say that, well, you are saying, I want to be happy. I should love myself and I should love those people, but I'm not gonna repress any of my attachment or anger or hatred or any other emotions so that I can try to think that I am and therefore helping that person suffering or helping my suffering because that's not actually what bodhicitta is. You're not gonna develop bodhicitta by repressing those things. And by working through those feelings and those emotions that come up with other sentient beings and developing that sort of um, unat that great compassion and, and great affection then you make sure that you're not just overlaying that sort of uh, unconditional love onto other people or onto yourself or onto those emotions. So that's all I got. And I'm sorry I ran out of time. Um, I think I can try to take a question or two. Susan? You know, what you said at the end um, when you were wrapping up reminded me of what Autumn was saying. That, and, and I've, I've experienced this personally as well in relationship to my mother, actually, who's long, long dead. I mean, she died many years ago. Um, but she's still very much a part of my life. 
and recognizing the, the faults and the attributes, no matter what they are, positive and negative attributes of those around us, including our mothers, and that can start with our mothers and recognize that, you know, this person, you know, um, was, was so wonderful and had her issues too. And so that there, thereby you generate this equanimity, which was the very first step, even though it's not one of the seven steps, it is the very first thing. And so that's, that's kind of where we have to start. And I think what Autumn was saying struck me as a really great starting place for developing equanimity that just the recognition that we are all flawed, that we are all wonderful, that we are all, you know, we're all everything. And not suppressing, as you were saying, not suppressing the fact that I understand that my mother was flawed and not suppressing the fact that I understand that I am flawed and I'm wonderful and she was wonderful. So, I don't know if that makes any sense, but it was sort of, it all sort of got back to equanimity. And that seems to me to be a really important key to all of this. Definitely. It, and I think equanimity is actually probably the hardest step. Um, because, I mean, first off, it's the first step, right? I mean, the hardest of anything is just starting it but you know i mean it, the whole point of the the actual the titles talk about mother but you're really supposed to go through everyone uh you know you want to talk about anyone else fine you can talk about anyone else um that that's really part of it and ishikatsu does go through uh, everyone else, but the equanimity step is really key, and that's why it's the preliminary step. If you don't have that, you can't really talk about anything else. You can't even get to the relationships of any past mother, any past guru, right? Because your past guru could be you know, the homeless guy that you just stepped over last week. So you just don't know. And if you don't have that equanimity, then how, how are you going to do that anyways? So mother is generally easier for many people, but not always. And I understand that. But yeah. Bring it, Dirk. <laughs> well, first of all, sorry for wasting your time uh, with my other comment. But uh, really what you were saying about the overlay and all of that, I had to learn. And what, what Susan was talking about, what Autumn was talking about, I had to learn with my father. Because my father was not the one with a good relationship. My mother was a good relationship. My father was a very difficult relationship. And I remember the day I went, oh yeah, he's just like me. It was a long time ago, but uh, it was a huge difference when I realized, oh yeah, he's just some guy with all kinds of problems. That's all he was. He wasn't like father. <laughs> and that's the beginning of that, I think, so. I don't think there's anyone that can say that there's no one in their lives, no teacher, no friend, no parent, no relative that they didn't have a challenge with anywhere in this world. It's, I'd love to meet that person. I think that person would be fascinating to talk to. And they had challenges with us. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, but what I meant there, if, see, if people had told me when I first started 
that well no it would have had to have been longer ago than that but but when I was young and people had told me that I had to start by thinking about my father being uh, all beings being like my father and start some kind of relationship from there I would have been very resistant to it so I figure some people are that way with their mothers that's all that's the only reason I said that before I understand uh, there are some hand raised. Lucy? Right, let me figure out how to unmute myself here. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm uh, hi. Um, I, I kind of come in from like a um, Tao, Taoist point of view and not like I don't, um, when you're talking about the relationship for establishing a relationship with mother, um, that I would see it as like, uh, receiving yin energy like so not not assigning like a gender role to the mother as far as like maybe even being like primary caregiver but just the receiving like um, energy instead of um, like the fatherly like outgoing energy so and maybe um, using that to help adjust to um, receive um, accepting that those mothers in your life um insist, instead of seeing it as like if your mom you and your own mother had like a bad relationship um trying to you know mull over that first um but thinking of it more as like a polarity instead <clears throat> might be helpful in kind of establishing that just a thought that's an interesting perspective thank you yeah uh, Del. Um, yeah, actually, when the discussion is over on this, I just wanted to offer something to people that I'm giving away that I thought they might like. So. Okay, all right. Keep that in mind. Um, any other questions or comments? I think we probably should get going with closing prayers, if not. All right. Well, let's uh, wrap it up. Thank you so much for listening to my rambling for an hour. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, Dirk, do you mind doing uh, closing prayers? <laughs> Thanks. All right, dedication. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into the enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Jinrezi, Tenzin Jatsa, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Losan, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions for the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manju Shri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losang Drakpa, I make request at your holy feet. That's it from me. Great, thanks, Dirk. Um, just a very quick announcement. Um, remember that Lamala's birthday is the 27th of June. More information will be coming out. Um, and I don't think there's any other announcements except it sounds like Dell has an announcement. I'm going to turn off the, the recording though, Dell, unless there's any other That's announcements okay. first. Oh, all right.